Good day, everyone. We continue our conversation at the Bible GPS podcast with Dr. Billy McLeod. And today our focus will be the ancient world or the worldview of the ancient world. It is a fascinating subject. And LeBay, maybe you can kick us off with this amazing subject. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, the ancient worldview is something that I'm very excited about. Uh, sometimes... Um, I, I would say what uh, the ancients believed gets lost in translation because we are um, really focused on looking at the Bible from a modern uh, modern view. And, um, you know, a, a lot of times we sort of don't, uh, we discard uh, the ancient worldview because we think it's uh, it's outdated and, and that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm really excited about listening to Vili and getting his insights on the whole topic and and whether it's it's still worth our while to look at the ancient worldview, and um, and then tie the trustworthiness of the Bible into that. So yeah, and I want to add to that, LeBay. You know, what, why does it matter to know the worldview of the people of the Bible? So, Billy, it's over to you. Yeah. So thanks for having me again. It's a fascinating topic to uh, discuss the trustworthiness of the Bible. And especially in terms of the ancient world from which the Bible originated. Um, the Bible originated from a world very, very different from ours. And they had a way of understanding the world that was very dramatically different from our perspective. And this often led to two things. The one is um, Christians who read the Bible um, often do not understand the fact that there is such an enormous gap between the ancient world and ourselves. So they just read the text of the Bible, especially when it comes to elements in the Bible that reflect the ancient worldview from a modern perspective. So, for example, we will be talking today about the pillars of the earth and so on, these kind of things. So often, if you don't understand the ancient worldview, you take it totally wrong in today's context. So you understand it in present-day terms, mm -hmm. and this is, is not right. Billy, I don't want to um, go ahead with, the, you know, jump the gun here, but can you just give us a few d differences? You know, you mentioned the huge gap between our worldview and the worldview of the Bible. Can you just give us a few examples Okay, I just also want to say another thing, and this is that scholars of the Bible often has a certain understanding of the ancient worldview. It sets it in a very primitive context. So they see it as very primitive and not worthy of uh, in-depth study even. And this is our problem, um, the lack of understanding of the ancient worldview. Now, how does it relate to each other? It's a totally different way of understanding the world. So it's not just certain particular things that has changed with time here and there, something. It's a dis different system, a different understanding, conceptual understanding of the world. So between the ancient world of the Bible and us, there are a totally, totally different way of thinking about the world. It's, it's a different a obs observational system. Yeah, something. yeah. So whereas from our perspective, we, whether we like it or not, we think in terms of our world within a scientific context. Um, uh, some Christians, you know, they're maybe not so positive about science and so forth, but they have gone to school and they've been teached the scientific perspective. So when they understand the world and read the Bible, without even knowing it, they read it from a scientific perspective. <laughs> mm. So this is uh, our basic world. It, we, it's through and through part of our everyday thinking and perspective, even though we're not scientists. <clears throat> the same is true for the ancient world. So the difference is, whereas from our perspective, we have a scientific kind of understanding of the world. The earth is a very small spot, <laughs> very small, um, there's a larger world, the, the, the sun, the, 
you know, it just goes larger and larger and larger, <laughs> and we are really small. From the ancient world's perspective, it's very different. Um, we are very much in their way of thinking. We are part of the world. So whereas we very much distinguish between the spiritual and the material, in their way of thinking, that kind of distinction doesn't really hold. They have, they, in, they have a much more integrated perspective on the world. And what was important to them was the night skies. That played a very important role in their thinking. So they observed the night skies carefully. And they had a very sophisticated view of the world, of the cosmos, based on their observation of the night skies. So from a scientific perspective, our observation is through the telescope. Yeah. We see the starry heavens, but we look at it through the telescope. They look at the stars as an earthly observer, and that's a massive difference. So is their way of thinking wrong? Because, you know, it's from the earthly perspective. It's not wrong. And we'll see today why it's not wrong. But um, so the fact that they understood the cosmos from the observations of the stars is extremely important. That's where everything starts. And it's Since not, the, uh, I, I just wanted to add, those observations are actually not that primitive. It's, a, it's actually a very complex, uh, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's exactly the point. The ancient Sumerians left a heritage to the ancient Middle Eastern people throughout the centuries. And that included many people, but also the Jewish people. They were part of a heritage that goes back thousands of years where these people really studied the skies. Now, if one goes out, lie on your back in the evening, what you'll see is if it's a clear sky, no clouds, only the stars. What you'll see is that the stars in the east, you observe the certain um, signs in the east, the constellations in the east, you'll see it rises slowly. It moves around over your, your head and down on the other side. If you stay up for the whole night, you'll see some, some constellations. I've seen the Orion rising on the east and waiting later during the evening. I'll go out I see, okay, now it has moved, say, two-thirds or one-third of the heavens and slowly but steadily it'll move throughout the night towards the other side. So that gave the impression that the whole starry heavens are moving around the earth. Now, obviously, this is because of the earth's rotation that this happens. But what is also interesting, if you look further north, we're in the south, we can look further south. The further north one looks, the smaller is this circle in which the stars rotate. Until one gets to a point that is static, it doesn't move. It's the northern pole of the heavens. The same is true for the south. We have the southern pole of the heavens. So there are two stationary points that doesn't move in the heavens. And from that point, there are larger and larger just circles, circular paths of the stars. And in total, what we see is a big egg, a cosmic egg. So throughout the ancient world, the cosmic egg, egg had been quite important. Many different cultures refers to that. But this is where the concept originated. Just looking at the stars, it seems like a massive egg. And so they, they saw an egg. <laughs> yes. We do not see an egg. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <laughs> So that's a massive, massive difference, you know. So for them, that's the basic way of thinking. But it's not only this egg. They also see in the middle, because of the stationary point right there in the north, they saw a skisset, say, let's say a pillar or a large tree or something. And this tree is also, also called the axis mundi or the axis of the world. It's just the... Uh, imaginary axis of, you know, of the earth rotating, but it looks 
like for them, they imagined it, they used a metaphor to describe it, a rope or a ladder. For example, Jacob, he saw the ladder. It's a ladder, it's a rope, it's a tree. There are beautiful, beautiful descriptions of this tree, which is called a world or a cosmic tree. It's an enormous tree. The whole world is in its shadow. Uh, maybe I can read you a passage from um, the prophet um, Ezekiel. Let me just see here. Yeah, he um, describes it beautifully. Now, what he does is he describes Assyria, or the king of Aser, and listen to his description. So what he's doing here in this passage is that he is uh, comparing the cosmic tree with the king, or the king with the cosmic tree. Yeah. It's uh, in um, the prophet Ezekiel, listen to it. It says, and that's in, um, let me just see, uh, chapter 31, yeah. Indeed, Aser was a cedar in Lebanon with fine branches that shaded the forest and of high stature. And its top was among the thick boughs. The waters made it grow. Underground waters gave it height. With the rivers running around the place where it was planted and sent out rivulets to all the trees of the field. Now listen. <clears throat> Therefore its height was exalted above all the trees of the field. It's larger than all the trees of the field. Its boughs were multiplied and its branches became long because of the abundance of water as it sent them out. Now listen, verse 6. All the birds of the heavens made their nests in its boughs. All the birds of the heavens. Under its branches, all the beasts of the field brought forth their young. And in its shadow, all great nations made their home. <laughs> yeah, that's really. I weird. mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful um, description of the cosmic tree that we have here. So I think what is important is to understand this. It's a totally different way of thinking. And this is just a beautiful description of the world. Um, so let's continue. So what we see is <clears throat> that this cosmic tree, enormous tree that fills the whole cosmos, and within, within this egg, we have this tree. So when we see this, it's not only the tree that's important, it's also the different seasons. They so had a careful, careful observation of the heavens, and the equinoxes, as well as the solstice, were carefully observed. Mm. And in observing this, they saw that in this rotating heavens, there are four points evenly spaced through time throughout the year. Now, obviously, this is the vernal equinox, the autumnal equinox, and the summer and the winter sol solstice. Yeah. So these are the four points. Now, what is interesting about these points is that each year, each and every year, it so happens that on the same time, the sun will rise within these particular uh, points or uh, constellations in the heavens. So it's always the same. It doesn't change for a very long period of time. It stays the same. And since it stays the same, what happens mm -hmm. is that they saw that, they understood that as stable points. Very, very stable. And that's where the idea occurred to them that this can be seen as, let us say, palace of the earth or the four corners of the earth. So viewed from the perspective of the earthly observer, looking into the skies, these four points are evenly spaced, not only in the skies, but in actual fact, it forms a square, a perfect square in a certain sense. Yes. So that's why they refer to the four corners of the earth. So they saw the earth as extending. So they didn't see the earth in only in material terms. 
they see also saw the earth in cosmic terms. <clears throat> and in that sense, the four corners um, of the earth, they saw that as also situated within the skies. So that's quite important. The four corners, they saw that also in the skies. And that's why it's also called not only the corners or, or, or quarters of the earth, for example, for example, in Job 37 or 38, it's also called the corners or quarters of heaven, for example, in Jeremiah 39. So, so it's, can I can I just sort of interrupt you guys there? Um, just an interesting little story. My mum, when she went to school, um, I can't remember if it was grade two or grade three, something like that. The teacher um, discussed the fact that the earth is round. So she went home and told my grandfather, it was a very exciting uh, uh, discussion at school and the earth is round. And he said, that's a lot of nonsense. The Bible says the earth stands on four pillars. So uh, <laughs> yeah. sort of fits in nicely. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. And so in terms of the pillars, we read the same about pillars. We read about the pillars of the earth, but we also read about the pillars of heaven. So again, we have the same thing. Sometimes pillars of the earth, sometimes pillars of, of heaven. So, Willie, from our point of view, listening to you, one cannot make the observation that their worldview was a primitive worldview. Am I right? Definitely not. No, it was definitely not primitive. It was a very sophisticated way of thinking, especially when you read that the pillars tremble. <clears throat> what does that mean? <laughs> the pillars tremble. And this enormous tree, we read it, it's been cut down. Now, this is also observed in the skies because of precession, precession of the poles and of the equinoxes. It's a very slow process, but after 2,200 years, those four stable points actually move slowly but steadily towards the next constellation, actually so, moving backwards. Yeah. So, so Vili, uh, at the time of Christ, um, I'm just throwing it out there, you can answer or not. At the time of Christ, where was that cosmic tree? pointing to, and where is it currently pointing to? Yeah, so the cosmic tree in, <clears throat> in about 2,800 or 2,900 BC, it was <clears throat> pointing towards a pole, a pole star, a polar star, Tiban. That's a star that's situated in the large dragon, in Draco. And today it's directed towards Polaris. It's another polar star. There are very few on this it's actually a very long journey. This um, slow process of the sun moving away from one constellation to another, it will take it 26,000 years to move around to the same spot again. But in moving from the one constellation, these four markers in the celestial skies, in moving from one to the other, the idea occurred to them that the pillars was not that stable. It's stable enough to call them pillars. <laughs> but now they would, they would talk about the pillars in a different way. And they would say the shakes. For example, we read in Job 26, 11, he shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble. Job 9, 6, also in Job 26, the pillars of heaven tremble. <laughs> so the idea that we get here is that it's not only stable points, but it's also three months. So this is a marvelous description. You know, it's only from about, let's say, 2000 BC that it has first been observed. The precession of, of the equinoxes works uh, slowly, but steadily. the people of the ancient world, especially the astronomers and so on, that were carefully studying the skies, they observe it. And we can see it because, for example, at first they used the sign of the bull, where extensively used and then suddenly they changed gears we can say they start using the sign of the ram in the same context and then suddenly at the time of christ just after about 100 slightly more years 150 to 200 years after christ the fish suddenly became a dominant symbol and also became associated with christ especially because of the fact that Christ came exactly at the time 
when we move from the one era towards the other era. So what you can immediately see is that the sophisticated worldview. It was not a primitive way of thinking. It was very sophisticated. So thinking in terms of real pillars that is somewhere in the heavens or somewhere, you know, the earth is flat, standing on four, four pillars. Even some scholars sometimes have this primitive conception of the world. <laughs> but what they, I haven't read the Bible carefully because we read here that it's also not only the pillars of the earth, it's also the pillars of the heavens. <laughs> yeah. So it's wrong just to think it's somewhere on earth or somehow the earth is flat. These were not the ideas of the ancient people. They didn't understand it in this way. So they had uh, definitely a very sophisticated understanding. But let me add something. So they, they understood the earth in cosmic terms. But now in terms of, of the cosmic tree, they could immediately distinguish between above the earth and under the earth. Today, with a round earth, where is above and where is below? <laughs> yes. I mean, it doesn't make sense at all. But in their perspective, with the earth defined in terms of these four points, um, cosmic points, immediately in terms of the axis, the cosmic axis, we have above and we have a blood. So they saw the, this, this, the, the celestial skies in the north in the area close to the polar star, they ident identified that with heaven, with the cosmic heavens. There are different kinds of heavens, but that's the starry and the cosmic heavens. And then the other world, the underworld or the other world, or, and so forth was understood as being below that um, conception, ancient conception of, of the earth. So now we can understand why the underworld is underneath and the heavens is on top. And what we'll often find even in the Bible is that the stars are identified with the angels. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a feature that uh, yeah. gets brought up quite often, the wandering, uh, wandering stars. Yeah, yeah. I think one reads the Bible and sometimes one do not carefully observe these things, but that there can be no doubt that sometimes the, um, the angels were related to, um, to the stars. For example, we can, I can take an example. We read, for example, in um, uh, the, the, the Song of Deborah, and there we read how the angels has moved in their circuits. Yes. <laughs> the angels in their circuits. So it's referring to the planets. Um, Job also has beautiful descriptions of that. Um, another one is, for example, in the book of Revelation, where we see the seven stars in that. In Christ, Christ, Christ is holding seven stars in his hand. And then he says that that refers to um, seven angels. He calls it angels. It's not usually taken as the ministers of the different congregations or early churches. But the point is just that they had this conception that the stars represent the gods. And later, in Judeo-Christian perspective, the gods were understood as angels. So it's lesser gods. You have God and the lesser gods or the angels. They sometimes so refer they, to the small G gods. <laughs> So yeah, the, so they understood, yeah, they un understood the, the, the stars as representing the gods. That's, for example, we would read um, the Lord of the, um, what is it in English? <laughs> the Lord of the host. Yes, the Lord of the host. Now, that is the heavenly host. Yes. And it's used to refer to the angels. But it's at the same time, it has reference to all the many stars in the sky, a lot of hosts. There are many places, for example, in the beginning of the Deuteronomy Week, one can clearly see this. Mm -hmm. So what we find is there's a close relation. Now, is it that they saw the stars as angels? No, that's not right. Yeah. They just represent. So the northern skies, the northern polar region, 
were associated with heavens, but they didn't understand that this is the heavens because they understood that there's another world, an invisible world that underlies the material world. So to them, the northern skies and especially the polar region were just within the skies. When one look up, one see the polar region. It's just representative of another world beyond the stars that we cannot see and don't have physical access to, which we call the heavens, where God resides. The same is true for the underworld. So they didn't look at the stars and say, there is the underworld. That's not right. But they had the good sense to understand that this is just a representation of these cosmic regions beyond our human experience in terms of material experience physical experience. I saw these realms, the heavens or heaven and the underworld, but they understood that these realms are situated beyond the material world in a world not visible to us. This is the world where the angels and the souls and in their terms, the gods reside. Veli, yeah. can, can I then um, deduce that the reason why it's an, really important to understand their ancient worldview is so that people don't disregard the trustworthiness of the Bible based on this sort of belief that it was primitive. And because I've had people tell me, okay, it's, it's full of primitive stories and it's an interesting read, but don't take it seriously. Uh, so if you don't understand the ancient world, thing, you would think that they have had this primitive idea of a three-tiered universe of cosmos, the heavens being above the earth. In today's world, it doesn't make sense. It's, it's just senseless. So, you know, from a scientific perspective, I'm trying to understand these terms, this terminology in the Bible. It just doesn't make sense. So that's why people, are, especially learned people and scholars, are fast to say, no, this is very primitive. They had this primitive understanding of the world. They don't have, didn't have a primitive understanding. They had a very, very, very sophisticated understanding of the world. And the interesting thing is, that conception is not in conflict with the scientific perspective. Yeah. It's not, in, it's not in, any, in any sense in conflict. Because many Christians, which who are also scientists, they understand the material world mm. from a scientific perspective. Yeah. But when they read the Bible, they distinguish there's another realm, an invisible spiritual realm, in which the heaven where God resides and the angels and the un underworld if you die, or oh, Hades, in the biblical way of talking, Hades, where we go, also the Greek way of talking. So there's a, another realm, but I understand that this realm is, after all, a spiritual realm. So I think it's, it's physical. It, it's not somewhere in this universe, in this yeah. material universe. Yeah. So I, I think it's important to, to realize that, um, you know, we all operate from a specific observational point. Um, and that's an observational point in a specific time period, if I can put it that way. And that's sort of, uh, you know, yeah, so what it boils no, down to. There are no conflict between the scientific worldview and the ancient worldview. But if we have a wrong understanding of the ancient worldview, or if we look at that ancient worldview from a scientific angle and try to understand it in scientific terms, it doesn't make sense to us. And then it's just a, a logical reaction to say it's nonsense, but it's not. It's just that these people do not understand the ancient worldview. Billy, I have a question for you about astrology. Where does yeah. astrology fit into this? Because, you know, the, the reading the stars are still very, very important to, to this world. You see it in all the newspapers. People yeah. want to yeah. know about their future. Where does this fit in? Yeah, that was actually a Babylonian endeavor, uh, astrology, trying to uh, understand the movement of especially the planets within circular um, uh, 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 stellar um, constellations and trying to make sense of that and trying to predict the future using that. And uh, not in the individual individual sense, except regarding the king. It was usually 
Um, the omen was understood, for example, it's a bad omen if this happens, especially Mars. They were very afraid of Mars, the red planet. And uh, so they had a long string of <laughs> ways to try and interpret the heavens and seeing these omens. But that's very much a Babylonian thing. Long before the Babylonians, the Sumerians studied the skies. And the ancient worldview evolved from that perspective. It has nothing at all to do with astrology. Nothing. You'll find the same in Job. There are such beautiful descriptions of the starry heavens, of the bear leading its small ones, you know, and so on. Uh, uh, of the zodiac, even, <laughs> in Job. You know, um, so the stars are described in the Bible. is often referenced the as I've just already uh, mentioned, that the starry heavens were seen as representing God's host, you know, all the many angels. So uh, that was, that's not strange to the Bible. That's the world of the Bible. But okay. astrology, that's a different endeavor, and that's um, not something that the biblical authors, especially the prophets like Isaiah, Mm. They do not see it in a positive way. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to add that the Bible is very specific when it comes to divination. I mean, Leviticus 19 verse 26 says, uh, you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's, in my view, it's actually a pity that modern man has, um, well, they have an interest in the stars. You know, they're studying it through telescopes and so forth which is a nice endeavor. I mean, it's wonderful. It's part of science. But to just sit outside next to the campfire and see the constellations, and there's such beautiful stories that the ancients told about these constellations, describing things that happen in the celestial skies. Um, for example, I've mentioned the tree that's cut down. And one would listen to the story about this massive tree, you know, spoken of by... For example, I've mentioned it, the prophet Ezekiel. And this tree is cut down, this massive tree, all the birds, all the animals, all the great kingdoms of the world situated under this tree. And now it's cut down. <laughs> now, if we, if we don't understand the ancient context and the ancient world, we'll just say it's just a symbol of the king and his rule that has come to an end. But the moment that we understand that this very same metaphor, this, this image, is also found in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which goes back about 2000, 2000 the earliest in the old Babylonian times, let's say 2800 BC. And here it has a totally different perspective. It's a great, it's an it's a enormous tree, it's in the Lebanon, it's cut down, but it's not a symbol of a king or something. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, we have this very same image, but in that context, now this is a longer story because now we have to discuss the epic in more detail. <laughs> but <you> <laughs> but uh, it meant the same thing. It means that there was a point where the polar star, the, the, the axis mundi, was directed towards the polar star. And because of the procession, slowly but steadily it moved away. And that was a very significant moment. The ancient people saw how this axis moved away. Suddenly, the polar star was not, before it was just standing still, it was stationary. But now suddenly it started moving and it was clear. <laughs> they envisioned it as falling towards the ground. So that uh, the was, cutting down of the tree was that transition point between Tuban and Polaris. Right. Yeah, so when it's cut sure. down, so they had these images and this, these stories, you know, these beautiful ways of telling these stories, myths, actually, that tells the story of the stars. It's not just a story, it's a story of the meaning. Mm. And it's been used throughout the ancient world, but also in biblical tradition. And the biblical authors used it, for example, Ezekiel, when he's referring to the king of Asher, but it's part of the world. But what is interesting is the understanding of these things and what it means and how sophisticated that is. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And Veli, why would you say this is important to teach to people? Why, why do Bible-believing Christians need to, to know these things? 
I think the first thing is that, you know, in some way I found that theologians are not that, um, you know, they, most of them know very little about the ancient world before the exile, the ancient world of the Sumerians, etc., etc. So they always see it in terms of those late periods for the, many of them, not all of them, obviously. But even in those cases, very few biblical scholars has a good understanding of the ancient world from which the biblical world be originated. And that's a pity because that means that that way that they teach peoples is often just wrong. It's just plain wrong. They have this caricature of the ancient world and often this leads to disbelief. The students think, you know, if the biblical perspective is such a primitive you know, it's so totally unscientific. How can I believe anything in the Bible? Yeah. But once we see how sophisticated it is and how consistent and that it's not in conflict with the scientific worldview, suddenly everything changes. And, you know, now Christians that takes this, let me say, too serious. <laughs> they think there are really pillars. And the Bible says there are four pillars and that implies that which implies that it is flat. And they see it in conflict with science. You know, they take a wrong, a wrong path. That's not the way to think. And the reason is they think in scientific terms. They do not understand the ancient way, uh, ancient ways of thinking, the ancient worldview. So if one understands it in every respect, it supports the trustworthiness of the Bible. Mm, sure. LeBay, I think on this amazing note, we need to conclude because, you know, there's so much food for thought. Well, it was really fascinating. I was just taking it in and I want to listen to the podcast again and again to, you know, it needs to grow on you. But if it was primitive, as people want to claim, then Psalm 19 verse 1 would not have been in the Bible. I want to close with that. The heavens declare the glory of God. It could not not have been primitive for them. Otherwise, the author of this psalm would not have started this beautiful psalm with these words. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And many times when I talk to people, when we think about the sky, you know, what's behind that, what's behind that, you're just in awe of, of God's glory. You know, as ministers, we have the prayer of adoration when we start a worship service and we will normally pray um, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You know, um, we, we just in awe of God's creation. And thank you very much for helping us that the worldview of the Bible was a fascinating and not a primitive worldview and that it doesn't oppose science. So thank you very much, Billy. Lebe, you have the last word. Oh, I just wanted to say that this is actually, I mean, it was a wonderful podcast, love the information, but this is a starting point. And uh, what we would like to do down the line is expand a bit more on this and uh, um, our listeners to slowly educate them um, and, and to enable them to, to have a conversation when these things come up. So, but, but thank you, Veli. That was really great. Have a nice okay. day.